I'm here with the lovely Kat Sandler, the writer-director of Love, Sex, Money, now playing at the Next Stage Festival. Um, tell me a little bit about Love, Sex, Money. I think at its core, Love, Sex, Money is a story about loneliness. And it's about the ways that we... <laughs> I think that we have so many bells and whistles on the idea of love now in the society that we live in, especially... So, <laughs> I'm so sorry, they're doing West End Story. <laughs> I'm going to start it again. Stop it! Kat Sandler is calling. Yeah, you can't write that. It's being a professional distractor. As, as, as the uh, official dramaturg of Cedar Bruja, I'm Mrs. Tom McGee. Fix Kat Sandler's uh, interviewing. <laughs> Excellent. No, no, please feel free to interject at the end Thank of you. every answer. Actually, Tom McGee should probably give you this answer. He's better at this one. What, what is, about, uh, what is uh, Love Sucks Money about? Tell me a bit about it. Well, uh... Love, Sex, Money, and actually Theater Brujaha in general came out of uh, a number of drunken conversations between Kat and I where we were just kind of frustrated that we weren't seeing or doing the kind of theater that we really liked. And what's nice is since we started to do uh, Theater Brujaha, we found those companies and we found those ideas elsewhere as well. Um, but, I mean, growing up in the internet age, we remember both sides, right? I mean, you remember pre-internet, post-internet. I remember course, the, the yeah. first, like, I went to YTV.com was my first internet site. Yes. Like, it's cool because we, we have a, a full, as sort of 20-somethings, we have that full idea. And plays aren't really addressing that right now. I mean, this year's seen uh, George F. Walker try his hand at like a young tone in play. It was, a, it was a neat play, but I didn't really feel like it spoke our language. It spoke George F. Walker speaking our language, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so Love, Sex, Money, what's Love, Sex, Money about? Uh, it's about trying to find intimacy in the internet age, where everything's a little bit more complicated for various reasons, whether it's, I mean, in our case, it's girls selling her virginity online, which raises a whole and, bunch of And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's actually based on a, yes, a real it's, uh, a it's real based story. on a true story. There's a woman, uh, she was a... I did this one. Oh, yeah. uh, in 2008, there was a women's studies major in the States named Natalie Dillon who sold her virginity online through the Moonlight Bunny Ranch in Nevada, which is a legal brothel because in... Nevada prostitution is legal, um, claiming that she she wanted to use the funds to pay for her higher education, um, and bids reached offers of over 3.7 million, depending on who you talk to. She was all over the news in America. She was on the Tyra Banks show. She was on Larry King, um, and I it, it was crazy to me that no one had wanted to write something about this, or that we don't have a Hollywood film about this. Yeah, because regardless of whether or not the transaction was consummated, it's such an incredible dramatic cliffhanger that I thought really needed to be explored. Interestingly, the the value of uh, or the the financial value that was you could say determined mm -hmm. by that real life case, you you kind of skirt around in your story. You leave it as a kind of a vague notion that it is mm -hmm. something. It is a, a considerable sum. Mm -hmm but you never specify anything. Was there a particular reason you made that dramaturgical choice? We like to leave it up to the imagination because I can't put a value on someone's virginity. I'd rather that people do it in their minds. Well, and, and similarly to... <laughs> freaking compare ourselves to literary greats, but I mean, in the same way Mary Shelley never tells you what Frankenstein looks like, Frankenstein becomes a hell of a lot less scary when it's described poorly. So, uh, actually, throughout the process, uh, Kat, Monty, our other... Uh, Ruhaha, member and I, we talked constantly about what that number was, but there isn't a satisfying figure to put on that number, really, that we could find that as an audience member I wouldn't either think was too high or too low, you know? Mm -hmm. So by leaving it ambiguous, it I know it frustrates some audience members, we've certainly heard that. On the other hand, it means that no one is sitting there going, oh, really? Or going, oh, <laughs> really? You know? Um, so it kind of falls in that mid-zone. And also because we didn't want to try and tell this girl's story. We wanted to try and tell Olivia's story, who's our fictional version of this girl uh, from the Money Ranch. So much of what we try to do at Bruja is give people something to talk about after. And if you give people the answers, what are they going to debate at the bar later? That's a good strategy. <laughs> it strikes me another another interesting aspect of your, of your, um, your piece that isn't so immediately... Uh, evident on the outset, it's not uh, an inherent part of the uh, part of the narrative, but is is the fact that uh, every one of the kind of three sub segments of, of the piece, each one of the three scenes, touches on the idea that seduction is dead, and that uh, in the information age, there's there's little left both to the imagination or or to mystery. Do you think that's is that a is that a good thing in your mind? Is that a you don't, don't seem to pass judgment on that? I don't that. think the idea is that it's dead. I think that it's just that we have to look harder and find different ways that it exists for us because we have things like Plenty of Fish and E Harmony, and these are all 
household names, these mm -hmm. dating sites, because of their promotion, because of how much our society is, or our generation specifically, is, is susceptible to these, this kind of um, promotion in terms of advertising. Mm -hmm. Like, well, and I, I think a huge part of that too is that oftentimes when I've read or seen things not written by our generation about this topic, about internet dating and all this sort of stuff, it's usually with a bit of a... There, there's a tone of judgment. There's a tone of, of misunderstanding. And un understandably, I mean, it's it's a strange and, and kind of uh, alien thing to a lot of people. But to our generation, I feel like, given our reliance on Facebook and our reliance on creating a virtual persona, we're more used to putting our entire self on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, on dating sites, or on social media sites, or even on video games. We, we, we show a lot of ourselves in these sorts of instances. Um, and... Going back to sort of our comfort, how comfortable we are with the internet because we were raised with it. I, I feel like that's something our generation is kind of the the forefronter, forerunners for. We we're on the cutting edge of that. We're a generation that's able to accept things like Plenty of Fish. I've got a ton of I've got friends who've gotten married off of Plenty of Fish. Um, we're willing to accept that, and so when we see that in a play, when we see something like Olivia auctioning her virginity off on the internet in Love, Sex, Money. It isn't, uh, holy shit, people can do that on the internet. It's, oh, wow, she's doing that. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I think you know. it's so telling that in this particular festival, so many of these shows are about love. There are, I think, literally four um, or five shows yeah. just with it in the title, about the idea let alone of the love, actual content. Because the we're shows, so, yeah. it's not, not necessarily that we're starved for love. I think we all feel love. It's, it's like starved for contact. Mm -hmm. Well, and coming to terms with love in a different way, sense you yes. know I mean since we did grow up in the pre-internet generation uh, I know for a lot of us this sort of Disney concept of love was what love was or um, particularly in sort of the early 90s before the divorce rates spiked through the ceiling it was that classic monogamous love it was just what love is you grow up you meet someone you get married you have kids yep. that the, I had a children's book about how to be a yuppie <laughs> Because there was a time when that was the best thing you could do, and that's fucking crazy! But we expect so much more from love now, because our expectations are so high because of how many movies we watch. Well, that and also the number of people that we're exposed to, I think. Exactly. When you, when you grow up in a small town in the 50s, and you yeah. don't have the option of, like, you know, being surrounded by so many, you know, nth number of people, uh, the, you, you settle. I think I think we're in a way, you know, our generation oh, is incredibly God. spoiled, and and just and there's <laughs> just yeah, the yeah, sure yeah. fact that we can mm -hmm. keep Access looking and keep looking, anywhere, and keep looking yeah. until we find that perfect yeah. perfect match. But is there a perfect match? Well, well that's this is so far think? beyond from what you need for this interview. But <laughs> it's like the idea we've. I think you're right. We've been so spoiled that we think the perfect match is out there, whereas past generations found someone and made that the perfect match for them. Well, they, they found something that they thought could work and then made it work. Yeah. yeah. But, and we and just we, expect we, it to work we, right off the yeah. bat. Yeah. But when exactly. you talk about the perfect match, Jim can order a perfect match. Jim can order a sexual perfect match. At, 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 at least. But he still needs to create but the artifice he, of, yeah. of yeah. love by feeding her lines to deliver back yeah. to him. But it, it's, it's really interesting, you know, there, there's there's a lot of stuff that I showed Kat, you know, when we were designing the show and we were talking about what we wanted and to do. And for the record, this is? I, I'm Monty, yeah. and, hey, Monty. and I uh, did I stage manage, production manage, and design the show. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when I was showing Kat a lot of the material for what we were going to do for the set design and for what the sex robot was going to look like, you know, there was all this stuff. There, there was this wonderful short documentary about the guy that makes the real dolls. Um, there's, there's actually. I'll send you this link. Yeah. It's the most incredible video about this man who designs these dolls and the people he designs them for, and it's, it's almost religious the way that these yeah. people talk about these things that have been created for them by them, because you can customize everything. You can decide the eye color, the hair color, the nipple size. Everything to to exactly the sexual standard that you want. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but then you you have to decide how important the mental and emotional. But, part so uh, in, in line for for those of you listening at home, uh, the second scene involves a sex robot. Uh, that's the reason we're sex on robot? A, Context. Sex robots. Sex robots. Context. It's a good thing. <laughs> we're have to this um, later. But uh, yeah, no. In addition to that, there's a fantastic documentary called Guys and Dolls about people who are in love with or have actual relationships with their dolls, which is how I first heard about these things, 
And there's a guy who at one point has to send his way, and he's uh, he's an awkward looking dude. He's 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 clearly you know he's one of those sort of introverted guys, and he's he says at one point he's like you know, I know that I'm weird. And I don't think any girl's ever really going to want to be with me, but I'm really happy with my doll. And then he ships his doll off for uh, servicing. Her One of her arm joints had worn out. So the doll's laying there naked on a table, and I felt awkward watching it. It was like seeing someone's significant other naked. And I was like, oh my god, no, wait. And I was like, oh, wait, no, this is just this guy's doll. But he'd imbued it with so much love and, and personality. It was, it was, it's a fascinating documentary. Or you can watch Lars and the Real Girl. Or, or Lars, Lars and the, and the Real Girl, yeah. Great, great movie. And... and one of the things for me, from a design perspective, and bringing in all of those images and the things we, we looked at, was you do see this huge, this this custom built, this custom design thing, and it 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 really the the thing that I realized about the play in in designing it was that none of what gets dealt with in the second act is implausible at all from a 2011 standpoint, like. It, it, anyone that walks out of the show thinking seriously that we have with with everything that we have on the table today that that couldn't actually happen it's uh, it's a little crazy no there's you know, definitely could- these dolls exist in someone's basement yeah in Germany <laughs> well, of course like, in Germany they're weird yeah. in Germany they, I, ah don't quote that <laughs> <laughs> but, oh it's staying in redacted <laughs> but it, 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 it's funny because you can see you can, and you, it, it just takes a quick search to see all the videos of all the all the things that are out there but at, 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 in the end it's it's also cool watching the whole process and the decisions that get made about at, at the same time we, it's a very human robot right and finally, uh, Kat, yes. this is, you know, I wish you all the best of luck with this one. I don't think you need it. You're probably looking at sold out shows and uh, wide acclaim for the rest of the run. But you also have exciting news about the summer. Tell me what do. happened. Yes. Um, we were selected as the best new play contest for Fringe for a play called Help Yourself that is co-created by Daniel Paget, who is also in, the, in Love, Sex, Bunny. Uh, so we're looking at an easy spot in the Fringe Festival, hopefully that's got a little bit of press behind it. Um, and we're super excited because it means that we basically have a season sponsored by the Fringe Festival. Amazing. And uh, can you tell me a little teaser? What yes. can uh, What can audiences um, expect? Help Yourself is about a man who is paid to help people justify actions that they, or <laughs> rather, um, choices that they want to make that are against our code of ethics, against what we're taught, against sh- social norms. It's almost as if uh, you're you're hiring a personal lawyer for your you to be for judge, jury, and executioner. Yes, for your own conscience. It's kind of it's it's an updated shoulder devil angel concept, right. and I think that <laughs> it's going to be crazy. <laughs> I can't wait. Thanks so much for your time. (laughs) Thank you.